and these several journal articles on philosophy and economic policy. And also, uh, Richard and I first met in 1980, I think. Probably around there. A long time ago. And uh, it's been beautiful ever since. So, um, so Richard and I will have a, have a discussion for about 45 minutes. Um, if, any, if you want to jump in during the discussion, you know, feel free, especially if it's something, you know, maybe to do with one of the slides that you might forget if, if we kept on going on. And then I'm hoping that there will be a, uh, I invite you for, to join us in the Q&A for about a half an hour or so afterwards. So I'll just start. I've got my little script here. Um, I want to thank Edmund and Philip for giving their approval to this session. It's a little bit unnorm abnormal, and I very much appreciate it. And of course, I want to thank Richard for agreeing to participate. Also, I beg your indulgence because there's a lot of material covered in this discussion in the sense of the economics, which Richard and I won't be really introducing. So I hope for those of you for whom it's not familiar that you'll just sort of go with the flow. So the work we're discussing is is this work, and notice the position of Marx's head, we'll get to that later. So that's called Rethinking Capital, which came out in 2016. Uh, this book uh, was based uh, in large part on, on Richard's PhD thesis, which came out in 1977. And there's another piece well, I'll just refer to called The Logic of Marx's Capital, which came out in 76 which is the only uh, work of Richard's where today's topic is, is, is his explicit topic, which is the link between the logic and, and uh, capital. And, I, and uh, there may be some tension between Richard and I in the sense of Richard, I don't think, wants to make the link as strong as I do, but we will that we'll explore that in this discussion. So the question is, why is the work of economic, what is the work of economics doing in a conference on the transition in Hegel's logic, or a uh, conference on Hegel's logic, and in particular a conference on Hegel's logic, to do with the transition from essence to concept, from objective to subjective logic? The answer is that um, I'm suggesting that Hegel's logic is a kind of logos for the philosophy of capital. Um, it's, in my opinion, it's hard to make sense, or at least for me, it's been hard to make sense of what go, what's going on in rethinking capital without some grasp of, of the logic. And there's two, two ways in which this may be the case. In, in the simplest way, the logic shows us how the concept works, the concept's intrinsic linked individuality, the possibility of objectivity, and then of truth itself. And it's only with these things having been established by logic that it's possible for real philosophy, any part of real philosophy, to have these properties as well. In a sense, rethinking capital is a project to show that there is a philosophy of capital which is conceptual, but not only that, but com com concretely conceptual, which therefore entails self-determination self of individuals, <coughs> A philosophy which in its culmination establishes a domain of objectivity. I guess the whole thing is a domain of objectivity, but anyway. Uh, and which we can know the truth. Uh, none of this would be possible unless logic, in my opinion, unless logic had been able to establish all that first in or as a domain of logic or determinacy per se. <coughs> so as well, uh, there's another link to logic, which is where Richard I may or may not differ. <clears throat> and that's to do with whether the conceptual development of the philosophy of capital in some way traces or replicates or has some sort of link uh, to the movement from the doctrines of being through essence to, to concept. Uh, the point of this discussion then is not so much to examine the success of this exercise in setting up the real philosophy of capital, which would be for, for another conference, but rather to to um, bring to light the necessity of the logic as a philosophical precondition, so to speak, for 
this particular real philosophy. We learn in doing of this philosophy that the individuality and objectivity in question are prescriptive, which is something we'll talk about, which will be one of the themes of our discussion. Consequently, to set out the philosophy of capital is to enter the fray uh, over the legitimacy of capital, which a fray I, I, I think both of us would welcome uh, anytime you feel moved, but in the question and answer. Um, it also should be said that this, this work, Rethinking Capital, as the cover suggests, is a rewriting, rewriting or rewriting of Marx. One of the underlying themes of, of uh, Richard's book is that the truth of Marxist mature work, uh, the truth of Marxist mature work, not Marxist mature work, but the truth of it, is not a descriptive economics, but rather an ethical philosophy of capital, which Richard, in, in a sense, has sought to reconstruct in his work. Uh, Richard has, in effect, Hegelianized Marx, Marx having Marxified Hegel, so, turning on his head the presumptuous Marx who claimed to have stood Hegel on his head, says the double negation. The, so, there are two dimensions, there are two dimensions to logic, uh, so to sum up, there are two dimensions to logic's presence in the macro construction of the philosophy of capital. These two dimensions are, on the one hand, the structure of the concept, and on the other hand, what, we call, what might be called logical's developmental structure, that is, the move from the doctrines of being and essence of the concept. So I want to begin simply by um, letting you have a look at uh, what these most schematic uh, two kinds of structure in the logic is. So uh, Philip, you can go to uh, slide two. So basically I'm just, so there it is. The, the, the black is, is um, the, the, basically the, any black, anything in black is from this. And red, the red is from the logic. So basically, this is just the, the most um, simplest setting out of the rethinking capital. So this is the first moment where Richard wants to just comment on this most um, schematic linking of the two works. Yeah, let me <clears throat> first say something general about um, okay. <laughs> what I am doing this work. Uh, in my dissertation, I undertook to apply the critique of political economy to both Hegel and Marx, to Hegel's treatment of normative economic relations in, in the system of needs and of Marx's capital. And that amounted to trying to remove from both Hegel and Marx's treatment all of the remnants of natural and technical specifications which still remain in use in trying to specify the nature of economic relations. And I wanted to instead uncover the fully social character of the relationships in question. <coughs> but then it dawned upon me in subsequent years that, and this is something I brought up uh, in the discussion yesterday, that any a priori account of convention is normative in character. Or another way of putting it, that if you can freely conceptually determine any structure of convention, what you are conceiving is something that is normative in character, and that what is normative in character is nothing other than a reality of self-determination. That meant, in a sense, that uh, instead of trying to deal with economic relations as they figure within civil society as a matter of laying out their social character. It was a matter of laying out their normative character. So the, the philosophical conception of economic relations is none other than the theory of the just economy. And I wrote a book of that title. It was published in 1988. In conjunction with another book called Reason and Justice, which attempted to deal with the totality of uh, let's say, ethical relations as structures of freedom, and began my effort to, in effect, uh, do what I think Hegel ought to have done in the philosophy of right, as to think through um, properly what are the realities of self-determination. And I think he fails in each of the three spheres of ethical community. He doesn't properly conceive 
how the family becomes emancipated and becomes a structure of self-determination. I tried to lay out how it is a structure of freedom in a book called The Just Family. I did something similar with regard to civil society in two books, one The Just Economy, the other Law and Civil Society. And then I attempted to do the same thing with regard to the political sphere in The Just State, uh, Rethinking Self-Governance. But in The Just Economy, although I spoke in general about <coughs> the way in which commodity relations can be thought of as fundamental structures of social freedom, I did not lay out in much detail how commodity relations become a system of capital. And so in this book, I attempted to fulfill that project. So in Rethinking Capital, in a sense, I am drawing upon Marx, because Marx did <coughs> present a framework that in many respects is usable in the attempt to think through um, how the market becomes a system of capitals and is an institution of freedom that is contained within civil society as a whole and subject to political regulation under uh, the structure of self-government. But I'm not really concerned with interpreting Marx. I'm concerned with thinking the true character of what the economy is as a normative institution. And uh, in that regard, I'm concerned with capital, not Marx's capital. And Marx, if you look at what he himself did, Although he at times thinks that he is, in a sense, modeling a merely historical institution, which gives his account a kind of empirical character, he develops it in a way that's fundamentally different from empirical model building. Mm -hmm. He develops it in terms of a kind of conceptual self-constitution of the subject matter, where the order of treatment is wedded to the content. Uh, I don't think he's successful in many respects. His, his treatment is marred by holdovers from political economy, which I've tried to, to remedy and I've tried to you know, work out how competition arises. And Marx also was never really clear on the status of the work, in particular its normative character. And he never went beyond conceiving uh, the <coughs> sphere of what Hegel would call the system of needs, and think seriously of the other structures of civil society, let alone the state. So I think one has to keep that in mind in terms of the ethical significance of the structures of economic freedom. Because they involve a realization of a certain kind of freedom which requires these relationships for their exercise, but these structures alone may not be sufficient to uphold the freedoms in which they consist. They may call for both private and public interventions of a very pervasive kind. And that's important in thinking about the normativity of these structures. So would you, but, when it, but going back to the slide, yeah. I, I take on board everything you're saying, but you, you said the, you had a lot about uh, something like the, the form. You're talking about yeah. Marx. Just under the line yeah. where you see yeah, form and self constitution and something yeah. like that. Yeah. So part of the self constitution, it follows that that will have to take this form of universal declared individual. Yeah, let me explain how that fits okay. into this notion okay. of how this is Please. not, an, how we're not dealing with the conception of the so-called understanding, which is thinking about the given. We're rather talking about a systematic conceptual development, which is operating in a conceptual autonomous manner, and thereby is in a position to think through the self-constitution of, of its subject matter which stands on its own, because here we are conceiving it in terms of its own internal constitution. So in a sense, if we're dealing with the sphere of economic relations as a domain of freedom, and by the way, I think it's worth thinking about how the economy as an independent domain is something that rests upon a demarcation of three spheres, family, civil society, and state without which you don't have an independent entity that can be called an economy. Um, but if we're thinking of it in terms of how the market ends up being a, a structure of freedom in which capital accumulation plays a, a predominant organizing role, we're going to start with, in a sense, the most minimal economic structures 
which do not themselves incorporate any further structures, but are going to be incorporated by all further structures. Uh, the argument is going to, begin, they're going to begin with the most minimal element of economic activity, and that's going to involve the commodity and the type of interaction that makes use of the commodity as its factor. And the argument is going to be moving from this minimal specification of the exercise of a social freedom, a freedom which is going to involve individuals interacting in terms of self-selected needs that can only be satisfied with what others have to offer on the condition of being able to satisfy their own self-selected need for what others have to offer, which is why the commodity from the very outset is social, but also normative, because it involves an exercise of right. And every right involves, in, shall we say, an exercise of choice that can only be engaged in by enabling others to exercise the same kind of choice. And we find that exhibited in the most basic form of commodity interaction. In following through what, what builds upon the most basic commodity interaction is this succession of interactions that commodity owners can engage in, which will involve, on the one hand, uh, such things as the, the formation or, or the employment of a particular commodity as money, as something that will be, in a sense, the standard measure of the exchange value of all other commodities. On that basis, one will then be in a position for commodity owners, if they so choose, to engage in sequences of exchanges whereby, instead of using money to obtain particular commodities that they will consume, they will advance money for the sake of obtaining more money. That We're will, jumping ahead. Yeah. But all of this will then produce what could be characterized as capital. But what, but what could be said to be capital in general because we're not talking about a wealth accumulation that is operating in any determinate relation to other capitals. It is simply capital without further qualification. And it is going to itself have a structure that is then going to be ingredient in further developments of economic activity <coughs> where individuals choose to advance money for the sake of obtaining more money, engage in such things as uh, producing commodities through using commodities, and on the basis of obtaining wealth that can be reinvested, they will then engage in structures of interaction where we have capital, not just being capital in general without further qualification, but engagements in capital accumulation that are themselves operating on the basis of prior engagements in capital accumulation. So we're talking about phases, particular phases in the life cycle of the same capital involving its particular uh, development. And that then will provide ingredients which will be incorporated when we speak about a new, more concrete form of economic activity, where individual capitals that are engaged in their own circuit of accumulation are now operating in relationship to other capitals. Well, let me kind of interrupt for a second. Uh, we are jumping ahead, but that's all right. When, when, you, when, when we talk about the capital, the universal moment, in our discussions, you've suggested, well, it could actually be just an individual capitalist or capital in a world where there are no other capitals. But I was wondering whether that, that um, so in other words, you might be able to sort of experience capital in general. But I would, I, my inclination is that no, it's, it's not something that would, when it, it, a single capital by itself doing its thing would, could not it's not an accurate, it's, there's no, there's not an accurate, it doesn't really correspond to what's going on in capital in general. On the contrary, you can't fail to encounter what happens in the sequence of exchanges constituting capital per se in every other form of the reality of capital. Because no. it will be incorporated. No, it will be there, but further features will then 
I, I, I understand that. I'm just saying, <clears throat> when we think about capital in general, is this, is this something that only um, we as Hegelians can properly appreciate because it's nothing, there's no empirical correlative. Cor if that's a word. There's no, it, well, it's not something that would ever appear to manifest itself. It'll only be something that we as Hegelians can can talk, could, well, could pro properly appreciate. Well, there are two ways of looking at the succession of the categories of real philosophy. Because we're, we're dealing throughout any topic of real philosophy with objective factors that exist in space and time. So it's possible to speak of successions that are not logical in character, but temporal in character, as well as spatially determined in various ways. And economic activity, of course, takes place in space and time, and, and the activities of any economic agent are individuated in terms of, each, you might even say specifically, economic space and time in which they operate. So if you look at the succession of structures that are constitutive of the reality of any topic in real philosophy, whether it's the constitution of the mind of an, of an actual embodied individual, or property relations, or the family. You know, you have those minimal specifications, which are then incorporated in everything that follows. They could conceivably be realized without the others following. They you, could be, you think that could applies be, to this? Well, too. they could, but on the other hand, they are also ingredient in all the further concretizations. So they're always present. You're always going to find what pertains to the commodity in general and all economic activity. You're always going to find what pertains to money in general in all usages of money. You're going to find what pertains to capital in general. There are further constitutions, but further factors are then being added to it. But for us to find what's true of all individual capitals, we would never get to it through a process of abstraction. We would, it, it has to be through this uh, philosophical self-development and to know actually what is the true about all capitals. What you and, so, and so I get the whole, this whole discussion yeah. in, uh, is, is to what extent um, we have to be Hegelians. And I, I feel that you don't want to, you don't want to say yes, but I keep on feeling that we have to know, for, to start with this structure of UPI, for, um, for us to, to be able to think about properly, uh, even to pose the question, what is uh, true of capital in general. And to find the answer, we can only do it through sort of the Hegelianized uh, social, social theory. Well, I, look, I, I, I don't think you even have to necessarily invoke Hegel. All philosophers, ultimately, are attempting to think through whatever they're conceiving without taking for granted its character. Of course, they may not do it in a way that, is, that can succeed, but do you want to to operate with but we have sense, to, we those have, factors that don't presuppose anything else. But we have to break with our, our brothers and, and sisters from the social sciences and somehow make a claim that we have this capacity to, to think, well, for, these, yeah. think these categories which, which, which makes them all look at us with uh, skeptical eyes. Well, first of all, think about what is our starting point when you, when you think about Normative economic activity, or another way of putting it, the most minimal form of interaction within civil society. This itself is predicated upon not just logic, which in a sense provides determinacy per se, but also nature. Right? You don't have any of this in reality, let alone you can't conceive it, unless there is a nature and one can conceive a nature. Uh, which is capable of containing animal, animals with minds, and, and finally animals uh, who can evolve to be rational in character. And then when we're dealing also with the development of mind through the full regions of linguistic intelligence that allow for philosophizing, you know, we're in a position now to deal with uh, normative relations. But when we're dealing with civil society, civil society itself and the kind of interaction in which it consists cannot either be thought or be engaged in unless the participants recognize one another to be owners, in particular of their own body, 
that they also are in a position to interact and recognize one another as moral subjects, that they are also in a position to interact as members of emancipated families, because if they find themselves in families that are not structures of freedom, they are not going to be in a position to participate in civil society in any free manner. So these are all, in the sense, the natural, the psychological, and the normative prerequisites for both conceiving and realizing economic interaction that's normative we're, we're, And that's what, what our starting point is. The thing that, that what I worry about is that this is, we're running out of time already, we have hardly even begun, but we, we as Hegelians are, feel comfortable with this, setting these things out in this way, but the rest of the world isn't. And, and then our challenge is to, anyway, that's a challenge for me, but I wonder whether we could skip to, I think, slide seven, which is, um, actually, it's, there's not a slide. It's just, the, the, just so I'll go to slide, let's say go to slide six. But in a certain sense, okay, I'll, let me ask you two questions at once. So, the, so what I want, because we are, time is slipping away. So set up, Briefly, the, the, the first sort of moment or factor in the development of the concept of capital. So in other words, we'll talk, I guess you, you refer to the commodity as the first factor of the philosophy of, of, of capital and its, its, its intrinsic social nature and its constitution. Some you've already talked about that, and its constitution through voluntary activity of, of well, um, homo economicus, and then, and then if you could, just um, sort of in Hegelian fashion, show us how that links to the, to the, what culminates your work, which is the ethical community of individual capital. Do you know I've talked about this? So, so um, just in a way that the, you, you could say that the, the idea is the subject matter of the logic, your ethical community is in a certain sense the subject matter of of, um, of the philosophy of capital, a subject matter whose sort of um, germ, a ger the germ of which, the, the first embryo of which is, is, is that in that first relationship, in the first sort of distinctive moment with which philosophy of, of capital begins. So, I mean, so first of all, link the beginning and the end, basically, what I'm asking. I mean, from the, very, from the very outset. Uh, Normative economic relations are relations that involve an ethical community. Um, and I know this has been disputed by some, and you know, many want to take the economy as if it were a domain of administration, of monological domination, right? Uh, following Heidegger and Arendt and uh, all sorts of Frankfurt School people. Um, to some degree, some aspects of Marx's discussion. Uh, but, but from the outset, uh, to participate in commodity relations requires that there be a market. So it's a matter of participating within an institution that has to exist, and it exists in terms of individuals engaging in the activities that are constitutive of it. Uh, you can't engage in an exercise of this type of economic freedom unless there are a plurality <coughs> of others who not only have property, but are in a situation where they are seeking to obtain what they don't already have and can only find from others on the condition of enabling them to do the same, which is to say, to engage in an exercise of economic right and, and operate in terms of the need for commodities that is specifically not just social but normative in character. And that's the starting point. And it means that individuals are already in a position where, in some respect, they neither can obtain what they want directly from nature, nor can they obtain what they want from what they already own. They're in a situation where they have self-selected needs that uh, can only be fulfilled by enabling others to do the same. And that's, our, that's the framework within which everything is happening. Now, I think the, in thinking through what happens in this situation, we're not talking about the actualization of potentials, we're speaking about, at every point, how we have enabling conditions. That is, the framework I just mentioned, where individuals face one another as commodity owners, is something that doesn't require 
doesn't dictate, doesn't necessitate that individuals choose to employ one particular commodity as money, but it allows them to do so if they so choose. And, and, that, and in a sense, that way, the movement from one category to the next, the category of commodity and basic commodity exchange, which in effect is barter, that provides a basis for moving to the interactions where commodities exchange by means of money is something that can be taken through an exercise of coordinated freedom on the basis of what is provided. But what and that then provides equally the movement to capital, not because of some necessitation through the actualization of a, a given potential, but once again, as individuals who now dispose of money and commodities are in a situation where they can choose if they so want to, and provided they're facilitated in these choices by the actions of others, to engage in advancing money for the sake of obtaining more money in return. So let me stop you there. Yeah. What, what, we're, we're really the uh, minister taking away. What is the continuity between the beginning, which is just this, the, the, what, what is the, uh, you haven't mentioned the pursuit of particular interest, or my, maybe I missed it, but, but what is in the satisfaction of that particular interest and, and the whole, the, the legitimacy which civil society gives the pursuit of particularity, yeah. which is this distinctive, what, in my mind, one of the distinctive, or the whole purpose of civil society in a sense, if one way of putting it. And so, and how, does, how do you link, how do you make, what, just in a few sentences, because I want to, we're going to have to turn it over to Q&A very quickly, and there's one other big question I want to ask you. What is the continuity in the, in the something which all of us can probably readily accept and, and see, under, as well as see, which is the fact that in the, in the free um, exercise of quantum transactions, it's, you know, it's purely voluntary, people are, and through it, people are satisfying uh, the particular interest in this mutual, complementary way. How is that still? How is that still the subject of the community of competing individual capitals? Well, all economic act activity, <coughs> in contrast to political activity, is directed at ends that are particular in character, not universal in character. Politics, generically, is concerned with the universal, or might call it the common good. The common good would ultimately consist in realizing and sustaining the totality of the institutions of freedom. But here, within civil society as a whole, and in the economy in particular, individuals are interacting in terms of self-selected particular ends that are of such a character that they can only be realized by enabling others to satisfy their own self-selected But I want to talk about individual capitals. Well, individual capitals. Um, first of all, when we talk about and capital, competition. Yeah, I mean, one thing to keep and in we mind. We don't have much time. One thing to keep in mind with regard to capital. <laughs> commodity. To be a commodity owner does not require that one be a single individual. You know, one can be a family that jointly owns. One could be a share issuing public corporation. One could be a municipality. One could be a government. One could be an international organization. Um, you know, the identity of commodity owner is open, and there's none of that is specified to begin with when you just look at these relations, in their universality. Also, in terms of these universal relations, where we have an owner of commodities, however, however they be constituted, engaging in the advance of money for the sake of obtaining more in return, and perhaps engaging in the production of commodities by means of commodities, um, none of that operates in a way where they are required to continue doing that, or to continue doing that on a larger scale. When, however, we have the market involving a plurality of individual capitals, then they find themselves in a situation where the way in which the individual capitals end up both providing one another the means of production, provide one another to some degree with the revenues that are going to provide for consumers, are going to also be providing products and services for either different parts of the market or the same market, all of this is going to create a competitive system where in order for the individual enterprises to survive, they're going to have to accumulate and grow and be able to invest in the kind of product development, the transformation of their production process, the transformation of their marketing process, and so forth, 
that will enable them to sustain themselves. So in this way, as Marx himself will say, without perhaps properly explaining how it operates, the basic determination of capital now become an external necessity imposed upon individual capitals in order for them to survive. Now that doesn't mean that anyone has to, to follow those, those um, provisos. Uh, it's not as if there is some psychological uh, necessitation involved. It's rather an, an, an economic imperative which will, which will impose itself through the survival of those that are more competitive than those who are not. And that is then going to engender certain economic consequences that have important implications for economic opportunity. Uh, let me interrupt you. I want to ask you one last question before we throw it out to the um, Q&A, because we are running out of time. And just in, in like a two sentences, tell us, I mean, we, both you and I have said that the, the concept here is an ethical prescriptive one. So how, how is, I mean, this is, I'll put it in a sort of silly way, but how is injustice possible if capitalism itself um, so we've, is just? I mean, we've, we've, if, we, if we gave us a few days, we could tell you in great detail the concrete individuality of the, this concept of prescriptive concept of competitive individual capitals. But just even so, justice is, is, is a possibility, and of course, we have the state to correct injustices. Just in a word to, just because I think everyone will be very concerned about how, why is it the fact that capitalists, cap, individual capitalists could be, in a sense, leaving aside fraud and that sort of stuff, violation of property law, could be true to their own capital, cap, you know, the, the virtues of being a capital, or even the but what it means to be an individual capitalist, but nonetheless, we live in a world of the poverty, unemployment, discrimination, environmental degradation. Um, how do you reconcile these two, two aspects? Well, first of all, from in every single economic relationship, starting with the most minimal form of commodity exchange, although it consists in an exercise of freedom, there's nothing about it that guarantees that all members of civil society are going to be able to actually engage in that activity. Because at every, at every juncture, uh, you can only engage, <coughs> exercise your economic freedom if there are others who, in some respect, want what you have to offer. And there's no guarantee that that's the case or that you can equally afford what uh, you might need in order to be able to satisfy your self-selected needs. So that is something present from the very outset, that kind of economic insecurity, that market relations in and of themselves can never secure, and that's obvious from the very beginning. Uh, but on the other hand, if you're going to think about this as an issue of freedom, it's not a matter of giving people uh, rations or goods, it's a matter of giving them the opportunity to exercise their economic freedom, which uh, I think one can clearly see from the most minimal forms of economic interaction is something that will require certain kinds of intervention, both private interventions in terms of uh, voluntary organizations such as trade unions, consumer groups, and the like, but also public intervention of various sorts. Now, those that challenge becomes more concretely defined in terms of the dynamic of competition, where you have, to begin with, a, a thrust for uh, enterprises or individual capitals to concentrate and consolidate, simply to, 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 to remain competitive. And that means that you have a growing imbalance between, uh, in a sense, the number of uh, owners of capital, however they be constituted, and those who are under their employ, so that there becomes a, a growing disparity between, in some respect, the opportunity and economic power of an individual employee versus capital individual capitals, which has consequences for economic opportunity. Let me, let me interrupt you, and I'm, going to, I'm just going to ask one last, last, last question, and put the same question I just asked you, but the other way, another way around, which is, what do we lose if we suppress capital for the sake of what we consider to be uh, welfare goals? What, would, what, what, what do we lose if, if capital, in the capitalism, the, the competition in individual capitals is somehow suppressed? 
Well, I mean, in a sense. there are different ways of thinking about this. Um, you could, of course, take the view that we're going to completely eliminate economic freedom entirely. No, just capitalists. And, and instead, well, um, all right, well, just capital, you, you, can, you can, in other words, restrict commodity exchange so that no individual can engage in capital accumulation, can but, engage in those kinds of things. And what you lose if that were to fall Well, you lose, you lose a certain exercise of freedom. Namely, which is? Your, well, the freedom to, to, to make use of your commodities as you see fit in a way that will be tied to others being able to do the same. And what does society lose if that freedom is suppressed? <clears throat> well, you then have to ask, what, well, what, what do we have? We have a curtailment of economic freedom yeah, but with no necessary benefit of any sort because it's left undeterminate what will happen if uh, capital is eliminated. You know, we can, we can have state-owned administration of goods and services in a way that uh, you know, unilaterally um, administers uh, individuals, um, but you know, you're depriving them of the right, potentially, to choose their occupation, choose what they want to need. And uh, you know, instead of trying to think about how we can ensure that everyone can fulfill their economic freedom, and what kind of regulation of the market and capital is required to achieve that. As well as, of course, to ensure that other institutions and their freedoms are able to be realized without being undercut by... We, we finally begun the story, and we're already running out of time. I do want to give all of you guys a chance to jump in. So please, um, if there are any questions and answers, uh, questions and answers, if there are any questions <laughs> or comments, uh, uh, right, yes. Um, thank you, uh, thanks to both of you for this uh, inspiring discussion. Um, I have a question uh, to Richard um, concerning um, the um, presuppositions invested uh, in the um, a priori, uh, in your a priori uh, theory, ethical theory. A um, lot more specific, specific, specify. Um, What's the kind of uh, freedom you are uh, starting with, and how do you um, uh, make sure not to um, mm, not to confuse freedom in this, um, let's say, objective or a, a priori sense with um, some special, specific? historical type of freedom, maybe modeled, uh, taken from capitalistic society. So, what, uh, how do you se secure, um, you say, the neutrality, the ob objectivity of your um, starting concept of freedom? Yeah. In a sense, what, yeah, what, what secures the, let's say, um, independence of this concept of freedom from any dependency on contingent historical conditions is that it is the concept of self-determination that is determined through nothing other than itself. And when you think through self-determination, uh, you find that first of all, uh, when, when you're speaking about the self-determination of, of individual agents, this is not something that is equivalent to choice, or something that the individual agent can exercise on his or her or its own. Uh, because when you act monologically, when you act simply as an individual, not with respect to other agents, uh, you're making use of the capacity that's given, that's given by your species being, your psychological maturation, this faculty of choice. And in using it, as Hegel points out, <coughs> you're not determining your own agency, that form of agency of choice is already given and has to be given to make any choices, but also you're not determining the contents of the choices, because the agency is something that pertains to all choices, the content of choices <coughs> can be derived from elsewhere. If you want to think of self-determination, you need to do something where you are determining the character of your agency through your activity, as well as what you're willing, both who and what you're willing, both the form and content. And that cannot be done monologically. You know, Plato points this out in the Republic by when Socrates is calling into question a possibility of self-control. And he says, how can one engage in self-control when one has to be both agent and patient at the same time? 
But when you interact with others, you can engage in a practice whereby you come to acquire an artificial agency, not given by nature, but established through the activity you engage in, and one in which what you will are ends that are specific to that interaction. The minimal case is property. You determine yourself as an owner by presiding over property, and property doesn't exist apart from that interaction between the plurality of owners. I'm going to stop you there. Yes. Yes. <coughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I have a question. This is kind of maybe... I, I'm not entirely clear on the concept yet, so maybe, but just possibly to push back against what you're saying about capital and the conception you're offering, just because... So this is a really different way of thinking about the relationship between Hegel and Marx, but when I think about the most fruitful points of contact, I think of what Marx does with fetishism as being really important, because in a way he takes up this idea of um, the way a bad kind of religious representation, the the way a bad representation of the absolute will work in our um, perceptual experience of objects on an everyday basis. And it seems to me like that is in some way really right about what it is to be involved in capital, like that you're misunderstanding how you should relate to other people, and then it runs through your misunderstanding, like of the say your aesthetic regime, to borrow from Rancière or something, but the, the um, object world, like the empirical object world, also. Um, and I just wonder. It seems like in order to have that kind of mistake about your representation of the world, you have to be also maybe mistaken about what the absolute itself is formally, um, because it's not. You're not getting. You somehow you like there's a disconnect. Like you're not getting absolute knowledge through your representation of the whole. Um, yeah, I don't know if that, or if that's well, for, first visual, of all, or... in participating in commodity relations, and commodity relations in the market in which the competition of capitals is uh, becoming ever more predominant as an organizing principle of, of market activity, uh, one's participation is not connected in any determinate way with any particular view of what's going on. You don't have to be a theorist about the economy in any particular way. You don't have to subscribe to any particular religious conception. That seems you can be acting in, in bad yeah. faith and conform to commodity relations, even if you regard usury and etc. as being illicit. The, the, the point is, you have to recognize, in a sense, the status of others as owners, as commodity owners, and recognize, contrary to the vision of commodity fetishism, that market participants preside over commodities, and they're only, in terms of their being owners of these commodities, do they engage in any of these, engage in these relationships. And that includes employees who are owners of their labor power. You know, they're not literally wage slaves. But even, if, even if they're in a situation where their economic options are limited by the dynamic of competition in various ways. But you have to have some self-understanding of what you're up to in order to act in that context. And it seems to me like you might say the problem with capital, or what capital describes, is an error in your self-conception about of what you are when you're acting. Um, Again, I think that's there's no necessary connection. You simply have to be able to, for example, um, understand the minimal manner of, for example, purchasing something selling something, and no matter what other views you may have, none of that has any necessary determinative role to play. And that's also why there's no necessary psychological compulsion that has to be associated with what one does. Okay, Steve. Oh, is that right? Okay. Um, I wanted to ask, I mean, I'm, I understand the turning marks on its head and rethinking capital in a in a more Hegelianizing way, but I wondered if I could just get you to say something about the Marx-Hegel relation in relation to the logic. And, and I've got an agenda here, actually, because what, what I'm particularly interested in, and I've talked to David about this, is the way that, the, uh, that Hegel and Marx differ from one another because of the different ways they can see the relation between quantity and quality. Uh, it's very clear in Capital that Marx gives an extended account of Capital, but it's all under the stated assumption that value has to be abolished. Uh, and uh, not only exchange value, but I mean value uh, as such, which is expressed in this exchange value. Uh, and of course, capital is then ultimately accumulated value. So this is, 
a, uh, an account, a normative account but, uh, of capital, but under the assumption, ultimately, that this all has to go. Now, for me, the ultimate reason why Marx thinks capitalism, capital has to go isn't ultimately the problem of surplus value and exploitation. It's to do with the fact that quantity, and qual quantity excludes quality. When you give something a quantity, you lose sight of its quality. And he's quite clear about that, that when, you've got, when you've got, something's got value, you no longer see its utility. Um, and Hegel has a very different view. It seems to me Hegel doesn't think that. That quantities can, in a sense, bear the trace of qualities. Now, I'm just wondering if you've got anything to say about that particular idea. Um, I know it's not directly... Although, it, I mean, it, if I'm right, then I suppose I will be on your side that, uh, that, uh, that capital needs to be sustained and thought anew as opposed to abolished. But I'm wondering if you relate this in any way to that relationship between quality and quantity in the logic. Well, Mark, Marx, like his followers, makes all sorts of gestures about how capitalism has to be overcome and pointing to something that is never really defined. There is no concrete normative theory of what is to replace capitalism. Well, it's quite a lot in the particular the government program. There's quite a lot, uh, actually. Again, it's not. I mean, that is almost... That, that's, that's not quite communism, let alone socialism. That's social, that's social democratic reform, basically. Um, but, uh, it's a system without but, exchange. But, but also there's no argument about how to fulfill these gestures that the dynamic of market relations is going to lead to its own overcoming. None of that has worked out. Of course, he doesn't even complete his account of capital. But in that account, you never let go of the qualitative side of commodities. Mm -hmm. That's always present in every commodity exchange. It's also at work in competition, where firms have to develop new products and qualitatively distinguish them from one another. And all of this becomes, remains in place. So, you know, it's, it's you know, I don't think that there's uh, some fundamental difference in terms of how one thinks about quantity and quality. I think the main difference is that Hegel is concerned with working out normative relations when he's dealing with anything pertaining to convention, like every genuine philosopher. Marx is somewhat confused. He's not quite clear on the normative status. He does recognize there's no juridical problem with the employee-employer relationship. Um, but he doesn't quite, for example, deal with what is possible in terms of private and public interventions upon the market and to what extent they can succeed in upholding social freedom. Let me stop you, Virgil. Thank you. Um, my question is, so you lay out the fact that the fundamental, or there's an ethical dimension to the economy. It begins with relationships between different human beings. Um, and that, as David, in David's question, injustice comes about through individuals accumulating too much wealth, becoming greedy, et cetera, et cetera. And as according to individuals in the economy can't be held responsible uh, because they're pursuing their own interests, particular interests, that is. And so it's the state which has to pursue universal good, etc. So it's the job of the state to curtail uh, the excesses of, of capitalism. And I guess my question is, if that's the case, then it's not only true that, uh, say, the UK government or the United States or whatever has to ensure uh, the stability of uh, justice in the economy, but every state, because I don't think it would be very ethical for the United States to have uh, income in, or relative income equality, good living standards, but cheap imports from Chinese sweatshops. And so every state has to have the same level of state uh, intervention, let's say, which means that on the, there has to be a world uh, control of capital, it seems to me. But if that's the case, then it doesn't seem you have capitalism anymore, because if capital is completely controlled across the entire world, uh, I guess, what is there left of capitalism? Well, look, you can regulate firms, both through international agreements and national agreements, municipal regulations. Uh, and in some respect, you might say that uh, only through regulation can you save the soul of entrepreneurs, however entrepreneurs be constituted, be it an individual family, corporation, municipality, whatever. Because only if you make a condition of competition that employers 
pay fair wages, have decent working conditions, have decent benefits, et cetera, et cetera, is no firm uh, disadvantaged from a competitive point of view by doing the right thing. But that doesn't mean that you eliminate capital or eliminate interaction. Now, you can eliminate it all. You could have a system where, you know, following, let's say, Plato's Republic, where the state directly controls, in a centrally determined manner, uh, what occupation individuals pursue, what will be produced, what, how distribution will be presented. This could all be done under democratic control. But that would not extend political freedom in any way, but it would eliminate the whole sphere of civil freedom. Not to mention, perhaps, household freedom and the like. So in a way, what one wants to do is instead ensure that the freedoms that require commodity interaction to be realized are available to all in a way where one has true economic opportunity, which requires both private and public interventions. I think we've, we've run out of time, haven't we, Phil? No. Or not? Am I, if I'm just no, 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 you've got a good half hour left. You've got till 12. I, I'm, I'm operating on a different time zone, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, take a deep breath. Uh, we get you. Anyway, let's, call with the, let's carry on with the questions and then whatever. You have, you have I now. have a plethora of questions. Well, they just, should be short just, and sharp. Yes, yes. They should be short and sharp. Succinctness is, is everything. The first is really directed towards you and is kind of a, an introduction to the rest. In, in talking to you, you've posited a bijection between the categories of the logic and the moments of capital. Whilst that's very attractive, since it provides principles for dealing with capital, uh, it seems to me that such a bijection you'd have to put capital as connected to the concept. And that would mean that everything else would be downstream of the concept that is capital self dimension And then if you went with that, it would be very hard to see how capital could just be a proper subset of the just state. As a final little... Uh, Addendum to that question, I want to ask if that's one of the motives by, uh, for changing over to conceiving capitals of the L philosophy in your more recent work. I think I've, I've, I was so confused about the time that I, I just say, tell me the question again very in, yes. in a slimmer, even more abbreviated form. If you make the, if you um, assign exactly one of the categories of the logic to, the, to exactly one of the moments of capital, right. as you sometimes seem to want to do. Right then the natural connection is to make um, capital connect to the concept. If you do that, right. it's a conditional, then everything is downstream of the concept self dimension And then concept, um, capital will be the superset of everything else, not a proper subset of the uh, just ethical society. I'm not sure if I understood the question, but I want to ask you to, do you, do you want to, do, were you following what Philip yeah. was saying? Have a go. You know, if, if one were to think that capital or any topic that is non-logical were to be conceived in terms of the imminent development of logical categories, where we follow the order of categories as given in the logic, you would be treating the logic as an external method, which is being employed to order a given content. Because otherwise, you just have the, the logical succession itself. And the problem is, when you have the logical category and you think through it, you end up with what follows, insofar as what it is involves its transformation into something that, that comes next. Um, now, in a way, the way in which, in logic itself, there is this unity between form and content, where the content is self-ordering, and the ordering is pregnant with content, is something that is duplicated in every single aspect of systematic real philosophy. Or, as Hegel puts it, where we're trying to sort of think through the, uh, the Zaka Zelst in its own internal constitution. I mean, that's a matter of recognizing that the true topic of philosophy is always the idea, namely this objectivity that is in unity with its own conceptual determination. And this is exhibited by how, in determining it, you are determining it in the order of its own self-constitution. So the subject is not the logical development. It's the development of that entity. So if, for example, you want to take uh, the totality of 
of everything that is conceivable and ask what is the subject that is in the, in the course of developing itself. It's not a logical idea. It's what Hegel would call uh, absolute spirit. Because absolute spirit incorporates not just determinacy as such, but nature and every, every development of the mind and, and rational agency. So I think that's brought up very nicely the uh, conceptual fault line between you and David. And now that we know uh, where, where, where you stand, um, I, I want to ask a question more directly at you. Lots of interpreters of Marx say that the logic of capital is its own self-expansion. You can't allow that, because if you did, then capital would just keep expanding until it covered the domain of the absolute. So is this a point where you say Marx is wrong, these exegetes are just wrong? First of all, you're talking, I mean, capital could be thought of in terms of the accumulation of capital, of self-expanding value. Um, but value does not apply to everything. Value does not apply to family welfare. It doesn't even apply to property, because property is not the same thing as a commodity. And in fact, there's one property uh, that can never be alienated, as Hegel recognizes, namely one's self-ownership. Uh, because if you alienate your ownership of the totality of yourself, uh, you basically annul your freedom in its entirety. Which is why, as Marx recognizes in citing this passage from the philosophy of right, uh, the only thing that can be freely um, alienated by an individual is the use of their body for a limited, restricted time, namely labor power. Um, so, you know, the domain of, of value expansion falls within economic affairs, which should not include everything. Not everything has a price. Not everything is exchangeable as a commodity. And uh, we recognize that insofar as we don't allow votes, theoretically, to be bought and sold. Or theoretically, we don't allow uh, uh, family relations to be governed in that way, etc. So I, I, I don't think the, the question of uh, the character of capital as involving self-expansion, which becomes an imperative only at the domain, at the level of competition, where individual firms face the um, the fate that if they can't accumulate greater resources, they're not going to be able to remain competitive. And that, that's what underlies the concentration and uh, uh, consolidation of capital, which has implications for equal economic opportunity that need to be remedied through public intervention. But which, by the way, can involve um, having some uh, regulation of the ownership of capital. I mean, capital can be owned in all sorts of ways. Um, did you, Philip, did you have another? I mean, Edmund, sorry. Did you have another? You can look back to two okay. later. Yeah, um, I'd like to just ask you about something you just said about the logic being an external method. And I was wondering how, um, I guess, I, I always thought that the development of the real philosophy was an imminent development from the logic. Which, on my understanding, means that all the all the all the determinacies, all the determinacy that has come to pass, is contained within what's currently being. Yeah. So then, I wonder how can it then be an external method if it's imminent to the material? I'm saying it can't. It should not be. Okay. That's what I'm objecting to. I'm saying you would be using it as an external method if you say the conceptualization of non-logical subject matter is to be done by applying the order of categories and logic to some material, to this non-logical material. And we're going to use the logic in that sense as an external method to order that content. Instead, if it's an imminent development, which extends through the non-logical subject matter, it is going to be developing itself imminently. So what is, de what is developing is indeed something that incorporates determinacy per se, which is what logic provides. But now it's further qualified as a determinacy. In the first instance, of nature, and then of spirit in its different domains. But even though it's an imminent development, you're going to find that it's going to end up with the structure of the concept. Well, all of these and things so, will be ingredients so, so, so in various this, ways. But, but, I mean, ingredients, yes, but the actual, actual, I mean, your own book takes that shape. And so there's no external uh, method imposed, but the imminent development, and I imagine this is the case for every uh, domain of real philosophy, will end up 
having the shape of the concept? Well, when you say the shape of the concept, I mean, it's not going to involve a display of the logical succession of categories in, in any um, duplicated manner. No, but there's going to be some middle ground. Well, I think the, the middle ground consists in the development of, of the subject matter, which, you know, Hegel describes it as being these, this, um, I mean, of course, it's, you can never use pictures to, to try to think about the bell, but in terms of these circles within circles. So, for example, take the subject matter of economic interaction. It, in some respect, is a, a, a whole in its own right. Um, so it has its own imminent development, but it has its own imminent development as itself being an ingredient within civil society, which is itself an element within the totality of freedom, which will be presided over by the state, and then, of course, an international order. So all of these things are going to be occurring in a manner in which, if you're going to do it in a, a non-arbitrary manner, you have to think through how the subject matter itself unfolds in terms of its internal constitution. So to the extent that property relations are ingredient in every other structure of freedom, they're going to be present, and they have to be recognized. You can't interact as citizens if you don't recognize one another as owners of, of our own bodies and not being slaves. But that does not mean that you treat property relations as a foundation or principle which is going to be that from which these other structures are derived in the manner of social contract theory, which privileges property relations. And wants to say, well, legitimate public authority is that which is going to be upholding property. Yes, thank you, David, for that very rich discussion. I wanted to follow up on a recommendation that Richard had made previously. So he was pressing you, I believe, um, about the social communicability of Hegelian critiques of Marx. Social? And social. Um, how we can communicate this to the public. Okay. And of course, this is very pertinent for a politician to communicate these ideas. Um, but you also raised the question again, you talked about how people have forgotten in modern um, neoclassical economics the social forces that underlie the economic regime. So why is that, for instance, we forget about the family and the state, civil society, when we talk about, about market economies? Um, and it occurs to me that, that you can give an account of this in Hegelian terms, and the way that you do so is you describe how there is a kind of alternative uh, movement of dialectic that leads to a destruction of the constituted categories with which you would pur purport to explain the movement of capital. Um, Plato in the Republic famously characterizes the sophists like this. He describes how there are, they have a, a negative dialectic that's motivated by profit in order to obfuscate the truth. And I wonder whether we want to follow up with what Stephen Fulvey had said previously about whether there is an alternative view of the categories in Marx that is tacitly deployed in capital that um, presents an alternative, you might say, um, inventory of categories that obfuscates the way that the categories need to work for Hegel. I know the problem is Marx does not develop any logical investigation of his own. Right. I mean, he, he really... If you can speak of any of his work being systematic, it's capital, and it's limited to that. And he, he does not provide us with anything else. Um, but he can still make assumptions about categories. He can still make assumptions about categories. Well, he can make all sorts of assumptions, um, but in terms of having a theory, um, I don't think there's much there in that regard. But with regard to the issue of uh, thinking about the deficit in rights, um, you know, you can think of the whole neoliberal way, which in some respect is following upon classical liberalism, as thinking about freedom as being a principle, in some respect, given in terms of liberty, which can be described antecedent to various kinds of uh, civil institutions, uh, where one basically limits the realm of freedom to upholding of property relations with the consent of the government. But one can show that you can't have political freedom unless you uphold not just property rights, but family freedoms and social freedoms. Because if you are subject to domination at home or in society, this is going to make it impossible to participate equally as citizens. So there is this whole domain of freedom that has been ignored by, let's say, the neoliberal way, which involves the freedoms that are at play in civil society and in the family. And, uh, you know, you have this, this view in kind of modern liberal theory which takes the view that right has nothing to do with welfare. 
and you find a new feminism that wants to say somehow right is something masculine and welfare is something feminine, which of course is the kind of male chauvinist view. But when we're talking about the economy, we're talking about a form of freedom. As well as in the family, we're dealing with a form of freedom, a certain kind of self-determination, which involves the welfare of the family and the welfare of individuals uh, in society. And these become matters of right. If one extends right to include the full totality of freedom, and it's important to recognize that, whereas in liberal theory, there's always this problem of how you can ensure that government, as a means to an end, is going to fulfill the end for which it has been instituted, namely the upholding a person's property. If instead you regard the state as presiding over a totality of freedom and recognize that political self-determination cannot be without the upholding of not just property rights, but moral recognition, family freedom, and social freedom, there is no problem about who's going to police the state. You can't have self-government unless you have social and household freedom. Yeah, thank you very much. I have just one question. I will think in asking myself, oh, I wish that really, you would have said something more about the market system, at the, uh, which is the actual yeah, pulsating part of the economic sphere. Uh, because, and especially about the ambivalence of the market system. And my thought was more that you have a very positive understanding of that in a Hegelian sense, which Hegel indeed has, because of course he thinks that it is a realization of our own freedom, because even in a market system, uh, individu individuals take uh, the needs of other individuals into account. Um, but I think what actually, especially Frankfurt School, 20th century and so far, what they criticized with, and I think Hegel actually would agree to a certain point and saw that, uh, problem is not because, oh yeah, it's because wh what is the institution that uh, actually saves that uh, freedom within a political or economic system it is the legal system, namely to have rights. And uh, the problem is not to have rights in general. I think what they criticize the Frankfurt School and so far is uh, liberal rights, namely um, the right to have property, uh, the right to bequeath, uh, because what is the idea of liberal rights? The liberal, or to have a liberal right means to be not restricted from a social institution or a state or other individuals, of course, within the whole framework of a uh, legal system. But the problem is, and that's where the ambivalence of the market system comes into place, is that those liberal rights within a capitalistic, is the excessive usage of such liberal rights within a capitalistic society, which lead to, yes, destruction of social freedom and to certain malformations of yeah, any kind of freedom and social being together. Um, because the problem of those rights actually is that then, in the long run, they exclude other people to even be uh, participate in those rights, because there is a form of inequality. And so my question is actually whether you can say something about that, how this goes within the overall concept, and how do you deal with malformations? Yeah. Well, I think, first of all, <clears throat> if civil law limits itself to simply protecting person and property, then it cannot remedy all of the obstacles to the fulfillment of our family welfare and freedom and our social welfare and freedom that remain in jeopardy if we let the market operate without any kind of legal and uh, political supervision. So that requires also that the law of civil society incorporate provisions to uphold not just property rights, but family rights and social rights, which of course to some degree it does in most modern societies. But it has to be completed. It also has to, of course, ensure that everyone has access to legal representation in all of the things that uh, pertain to fighting for such rights and upholding such rights. And on the one hand, that's a matter of, of law, but it's also going to be a matter of uh, what Hegel would call the operations of the police. That is a welfare system, but one that is not operating like many welfare systems that are essentially putting people on the dole, but rather a matter of allowing people to exercise their economic freedom by providing, for example, guaranteed jobs and fair wages, uh, which I think Hegel supports. <laughs>
in our view. We don't, we don't just want to give people unemployment insurance. We want to ensure that they can actually earn a living, stand on their own feet in a way that is civil in character. Um, so it's a matter of engaging in these things. That, um, this can also involve, of course, altering the character of corporate structure, allowing employees to have a definite say in management of firms. I mean, there are all sorts of things that can be part of how one regulates economic activity. But the normative aim is always to ensure that everyone can exercise their economic freedom, which the market by itself does not guarantee and never guarantees. And yet, you need market relations in order to exercise that freedom. But the unregulated market does not allow everyone to exercise the freedoms in which it itself consists. And that must be provided both by an extended law, legal regime, and also private and public intervention. And then one can think about, well, how is that to be done? And what does it consist of? I tried to sketch that out in the just economy. And I tried to do it on the political stage to some degree. Um, yes, in back, yes. Thank you. Yes, I have just a, a follow-up question to um, the last question on what, what you presented um, as kind of a solution that you have also social rights and not only liberal rights. And what you said um, as well in your talk that there need to be um, public and private constraints of the market. But still, um, I think a, a problem could be when the liberal rights are in the heart, um, social rights only have a um, supplementing role. So if you lose your job in liberal um, societies, then you get, of course, some money, but um, there are very strong conditions. So you have to do a lot of things then. You are, um, you are coming into an apparatus of, uh, in some way, domination. You have to um, always prove, I have to apply for different jobs, you have to take jobs you don't want to, and, and it's all, and the social idea is very strong coupled to the reintegration of the market um, system. The idea of social rights is the idea to reintegrate um, in the um, system of um, labor and capitalism. And so the social um, rights are, or the critique could be, and I think this is a valuable critique that social rights are not rights in their own right, but um, they are only um, a supplement of liberal rights, which are a form of domination because a form of um, integrating individuals in um, the market system, how it works. So I think this is Excellent. just to make it a little bit stronger, yeah. this um, objection of, of Claudia. This is the worry, it's, it's not a solve when you, when you just point to, to social rights. Well, if, if you implement it, you're going beyond property rights. Likewise, if you implement family rights, you're going beyond property rights. Family, family rights involve more than simply disposing of the property. They involve co-determination among spouses of both uh, the household and its property and its welfare and parental relations and the like. And all of these things are, are not reducible to property relations. And then the social freedoms, and all of which are themselves essential in order to exercise political freedom, which itself requires ensuring that <clears throat> differences in wealth do not produce political privileges and underprivileges. So all of these things are, 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 have to be regulated in a way uh, to ensure that the totality of freedom is available to all. And structurally speaking, uh, property relations are by their very nature subordinate. You can't eliminate them. Because if you eliminate them, or for that matter any freedom, you obliterate the possibility to exercise other forms of freedom. But they can be curtailed. And they can be legitimately curtailed for the sake of upholding the totality of freedom. So you, you have a right and duty to uh, pay taxes, for example. What are one of the, to add to build on what Richard is saying, one of the motivations for this panel, in my mind, was um, <clears throat> the civil and political uh, freedoms, which are um, listed in the United States, part of the Constitution, and so uh, take on the quality of the character of rights. There's a sense which you can get there, in a sense, through an idea of freedom as freedom of choice. 
right? It's the first, so Locke, for example, with his very restricted view of freedom, gets us to some, you know, at least he puts on the table the idea that a right to property, and in the social contract, puts on the table the idea of rights to do with the state. Um, but when we want to talk about rights that go fill in, which are ethical, like family and, and civil society, you need a different conception of um, the character of rights. Your rights are not a freedom of choice, but more the character that Richard's been setting out. And, um, but I think culture, the, sort of the world is not ready for this view that the, that the economy, for example, can be conceived of uh, conceptually that we can talk about an ethical, an ethics economy which has the characteristics of the logic being truthful, of having objectivity. And um, so in a certain sense, I guess I'm the, to repeat myself, the, my thinking here is to, is to um, uh, put on the table that we're entering a whole, a completely new world when we think of ethics, or think of ethics per se, but think of ethics particularly the way that Richard's been setting out, and that uh, it requires a way of, of thinking about philosophy, which is very different from, from the norm. It in, involves a, a belief in the capacity or the power of philosophy, which you know, virtually everyone doesn't think is possible. So if we're, so, um, You've, you've, you've pinpointed, in a certain sense, what at least motivates me in terms of trying to move the discussion from liberal rights to, um, I don't know what you call them, social rights or something like that. Let me say one thing about the role of conceiving economic interaction, or if you will, the system of capitalism, um, in, in connection with uh, the fulfillment of social freedom, which is a part of the totality of freedom. Uh, you need to, to see how uh, economic freedom operates on its own and what obstacles to its own universal exercise it engenders. Uh, you have to do that first in order to see what kind of legal regulation you need to subject it to, as well as what kind of private and public intervention is required in order to uphold social freedom. So even though these are normative relations and involve an exercise of a certain kind of freedom, just like property relations and family relations are not the end of the story. They themselves have to be supplemented in all sorts of ways to uphold, uh, to not only realize themselves, but to ensure that uh, they themselves do not obstruct political freedom. So this is a normative investigation, but it is not itself the end of the story. Um, and it, it itself points to problems, just as the account of property relations points to problems that leave things open to be dealt with regarding family, society, and politics. But if you don't, if you don't, ha if you don't have a, 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 an idea that capital um, is just, then of course you might find yourself sacrifice. You might find yourself extinguishing capital, capitalism, because and there are many people who still who feel that justice, social justice, is at odds with capitalism. So, um, we well, have to investigate where does the injustice lie. What, what is well, it, that's, that's my what point. Is the, what is the impairment of freedom that is to be tied to the operation of capitals, and how is it to be remedied? And only in that way can you read your the sort of. A, Read your world um, to know what the what the nature of the problems are. Um, any any new hands? Okay, Steve. Well, I'm just in a way. It's just a question, just to try and make sure we understand exactly what the rethinking capital is. Because I've been trying all along to think, you know, what. How is what you're doing different from, from what Marx is doing? Right. And as I understand it, then, your claim is, this is Richard, that capital 
is itself a form of freedom, and it needs to be understood in terms of a logic of freedom, a logic of self-determination. So the account of capital of giving is a normative one. But the assumption, if I can put it that way, is that this is an important form of freedom, it's an important component of freedom, it needs to be regulated, and, and so on. So it's a broadly Hegelian view. Whereas I take it the Marxian view is, yes, in relation to feudalism, capitalism is a historical form of freedom, but it's freedom that immediately turns into alienation, it turns into externalisation, it turns into oppression. And as I say, I think because Marx misunderstands the relation between quantity and quality, it's ultimately got to go. So I suppose the grand position that Marx would end up with is that capitalism ultimately is not a form of freedom. Now, is that putting it too simplistically, that for you, capital and capitalism belongs irreducibly to what freedom is, whereas for Marx, quite simply, it doesn't. It's a historical form through which we needed to pass because we had to get out of, uh, uh, of, of feudalism and which will get us to somewhere else. But it's, it's, if you like, it's a self-sublating form of freedom that sets itself aside. And I'm, I'm not... Is that fair? Is that the way you understand your relation to Marx? Or would you see it differently? Yes, I you have the theoretical achievement of Marx, which consists in his attempt to work out capital. Then you have all this other stuff. All these, what I consider really, say, by and large, empty gestures. He gives us no determinate account of what freedom is. As okay. he sees it, really. If you look at what he has to offer. Okay. But maybe, maybe Richard, you say, if that's already revealing in your answer, because I wouldn't distinguish yeah. between capital and the other stuff. Yeah. I would say they're into well, But you, you want to yeah, separate But I mean, if you think of what he's, he's done in capital, he's attempting to work out these structures, which he does recognize involve a certain type of freedom and, and juridical right. Um, his account is marred by bulldozers of political economy, uh, which are to be found in his continued adherence to the labor theory of value, which I think performs his account in various ways, and he doesn't really conceive of the various possibilities of capital. Um, but nonetheless, he's, he's giving us this particular structure, um, and he hasn't completed his investigation of it in the sense of investigating to what extent it can be intervened upon for the sake of the social freedoms and the questions of opportunity that to some degree he's aware of. Um, he, he, he never gets around to dealing with that in any, any Because he thinks it's essentially alienating. Manner. What's that? He thinks it's essentially alienating. And it's alienating even if you don't bring in to the picture things like uh, service value and so on. I mean, the exploitative side of capitalism, in a way, well, is well, almost yeah. secondary. I mean, it's alienating in its structure yeah. because of the structure of exchange. Well, his, exchange account of, his account of alienation is, is essentially rooted in mistakes he makes in his early works, which he then corrects. Namely, he has not yet thought through the nature of labor power. And in his 1844 manuscripts and other works, he speaks about the laborer as if the laborer, in a sense, is selling him or herself, where labor is offered as a commodity, not labor power. And uh, this also pertains, in a way, to the claims and uh, the German ideology, the critique of Hegel's philosophy of right, that uh, the working class has a universal interest because it really has no property, it has no stake in civil society, and so forth. But all of that proceeds from his youthful um, sort of obliviousness to, to the character of labor power as something that everyone owns, which is why, by the way, the right to employment is the foundation of economic independence and security. Because if those who are lucky enough to be able to have access to capital to try to make it as an entrepreneur or as a, a landlord fail, they then can retreat to what all the rest of us have to rely upon, namely our labor power. So guaranteed jobs at fair wages is really the ultimate foundation of economic independence and security, which the market by itself does not provide. Also, if you were to you know, go into the theory in detail, you know, take it every step at a time, you would, you know, as I see it, you would find that every moment involves um, the freedom which is self-determination. You, you were asking how do you know that but the, your, free, your idea of freedom is objective, and just a partial answer is that it, I think you would see that it, it entails the self-determination that we first discover in the concept. And so it, it, it possesses that kind of um, 
completeness and thoroughness that we find in the and uh, in how the concept is set out at the beginning of subjective logic, and every at every every relationship between free free willings, free wills who are free willing in a complementary and reciprocal way, you would find that being reproduced. And if you didn't, then you might say, well, this they're entering relationships which involve alienation or oppression or coercion. But um, you know, and hopefully, at every moment, you you could say yes. Well, in fact, um, we're all, we are always talking about free, at least in the in the in the, in the um, uh, prescriptive and ethical ideal. Uh, it's always this this uh, developing self determination. You need well. Thank you so much. For, I want to thank Richard so much for reading. <laughs>